a lot of the folks I've been interviewing are in democratic schools where essentially decision making is the curriculum in a sense, in the sense that, that what they're required to do is participate in conflict resolution and decision making processes. And so it's, I, I'm interested in, in kind of how you're shaping that in this other context, in this more mainstream context. Can, can you give me a little more, kind of an overview? Yeah, absolutely. So this work is rooted in work I've done within the field of supported decision making. Mm. Supported decision making is an alternative to legal guardianship for students with disabilities. Oh, okay. And that's something that I've been working on for nine years now. Mm. I was part of a grant and that grant became really much bigger than we ever expected it to. Mm. And it became the impetus for New York State to adopt a model of supported decision making thanks to you know, our team, thanks to Professor Kristen Booth Glenn, who was mm -hmm. a legal expert on our team, who really thought of this as like a really amazing model for students with disabilities that was really rooted in autonomy and choice. And like, nice. my job was just to bring in self-determination theory to that and sort of create a facilitation model that worked for kids. Nice. So the start of my work was in supported decision-making. And while we're facilitating decision-making in kids with disabilities, we're realizing that, my gosh, like kids with and without disabilities might not even know how to make a decision. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like it's, it's almost like a, it's very foreign to them, right? Mm -hmm. They can maybe name small choices that they make every day, but when thinking about larger decisions that makes them very nervous right and right right there's really no structure there and so new york state came out with a call an rfp and i was really supported in putting a proposal in for this call mm. i put in for the grant never thinking i would get it and we did. And so Hunter School of Education has created a decision-making curriculum for students with disabilities. The theoretical framework is self-determination mm -hmm. theory. So in cognitive evaluation theory, we use that very, very yep. deeply. But we've also come up with our own framework based on research called the guts and go model of decision-making. Hmm. And this has gotten a lot of traction in the, in mm -hmm. the last year and a half, right? So when you think of the acronym guts and go, the mm -hmm. G is to gather information, right? The mm -hmm. first step in any decision making is to gather information. And then you have to, you, you have to understand the information, mm. right? And, and how do you do that? How do you understand information? Mm -hmm. And so we go into that with kids, right? Mm -hmm. And then the T is thinking about consequences, thinking about mm. pro and con lists, thinking about, you know, like decisions always have this weighing to them, right? Mm -hmm, like what's the mm -hmm. benefit, what's the challenge? And then the S is we call SOS, seek out support, right? Because mm -hmm. no one makes decisions on their own. We want a lot of decision-making to be autonomous, but we also know that no one Right. you know, <laughs> across the span, right, makes decisions on their own. So it's important mm -hmm. to seek out support for your autonomous decisions, right? It's, mm -hmm. We're not seeking out support for others to make those decisions. We're seeking out support for our autonomous decisions. Mm -hmm. Then there's a piece where we stop and we pause and we reflect, right? Because the integration of all this takes time mm -hmm. and the there's different ways to pause and reflect. And we talk mm -hmm. about that with kids. And then the go part is go make the decision, mm -hmm. right? Go make the decision. And there's probably another part to that, which we've been talking about, which is, you know, part of decision-making is not only going to make the decision, but also communicating the decision to others, yep. Yep. which is, which is a different sort of realm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this framework has made traction. Um, there's been a lot of people interested. A lot of schools are utilizing this framework to teach decision-making in their students. Mm -hmm. And so we've created a 10 lesson curriculum for schools to use within different contexts, within mm -hmm. their social emotional learning classes, advisory right. classes, but also we've gotten great interest in terms of economics, education, history, mm -hmm. education, 
in terms of voting and things like that. So it's been interesting to see this curriculum and create it with my team and then sort of see where it goes. Right, right. But again, well, I, think, I, I think that's a sign that you're onto something really important when it goes beyond its original purview, yeah. its original, you know, place. Because, I mean, self-determination theory itself, you know, kind of started in a particular realm and, and it sort of, it, well, it applies everywhere. So, <laughs> and, it, and so it's really interesting to, to see that kind of, you know, a, a, as people realize it. And then the other thing that will probably happen is that you're going to run into the things that, you know, places where somebody independently came up with something very similar or very parallel. And then you sort of say, oh, okay, well, did they think of something we didn't or, or vice versa? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've been years into that, right? Like yeah. we've been through the eight steps, the seven steps, like people right. have all these <laughs> different frameworks, right? And you're, you're kind of, I mean, I think our job was really to take the different frameworks and differentiate it in a way that made sense to kids and teens, right? right. So right. Guts and Go has been a really powerful acronym in that way mm -hmm. especially for our neurodiverse students who really uh, like they get it and they can grasp it and they can not only like understand it in a logic sense but also like integrate it into their life it's something yeah. i've integrated into my life it's really interesting how it works <laughs> yeah 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 and that's the other thing is that that when you tap into something that's deep is it's not constrained by whatever kind i mean it, it came up in a special education context it came up in this very okay well we need to be more clear more think more clearly about this but then but then you realize like well n actually everybody can benefit from this it's a matter of okay what you know how does it come to you know what's the application what how, how can they adapt it into whatever they're doing like i say voting or 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 history as i think you said yeah you know, economics like, like that's a yeah, big yeah. so interesting right i never expected it to go there but apparently there is lots of decision making conversations within the economics world and yeah yeah the framework has been really helpful yeah it's really interesting it, economics in particular because they do a lot of decision making work uh and and, and they've been as a field been largely criticized by sort of these assumptions around rational actors or or you know certain types of models that they've had for human how humans make decisions and 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 so ways that it can become more realistic that they can have a framework for going oh okay it's a little more complicated and but but not just like simply more complicated <laughs> it's like well no there's there's some access to understanding how that this process works um and and I, and I don't know if it applies but I mean that's one of the things I've kind of been uh, puzzling out is what would it mean if they if they're looking at their sort of utility functions you know like okay the old model was they logically figure out what the consequences are you know from a from a logical standpoint but then what i've been sort of puzzling out is like well what would it look like if you were doing it from a primary needs standpoint like what does utility mean when autonomy is in the mix you know when what does it mean when your your perception of competence is part of the utility of whatever it is the decision you're making and and so yeah it's it's a <laughs> that's it's something that i think is i think it's important for psychology to communicate to the fields like economics that are dependent on the insights we're <laughs> we're, we're gaining and try to figure out okay what is the framework for them to be able to apply it in their field and sort of have more realistic more realistic ways of accounting for what matters to people. That's um, exactly so. what it is. Yeah, I'm I'm actually bringing this model to Prague in Eastern Europe this summer. Oh, neat. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, economics teaching there is different, right? Because of yeah, the market yeah. structure. So yeah, yeah, it's been it's been really interesting to think about both from a self determination perspective, but also from a more generalized sort of my gosh, this theory, this framework can grow everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world, where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important. Than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs, so that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, 
Don Berg.